We want to welcome you this morning if you've joined us online. It's great to have you with us on this Mother's Day, our week two of our Win the Day series. Probably one of the biggest questions that was asked to me outside of around what we were sharing last week about Flip the Script was this question is, what's on your t-shirt? And so, <laughs> so I thought I'd reveal the mystery. There it is, Win the Day. Some people were smart enough to work it out and others were trying to work read it every time my jacket moved, I was like, whoa, what is it actually saying? It's just win the day. Just helps me win the day. You know, when you get dressed, get dressed right, you win the day. So I'm choosing to win the day. Uh, you can pick up your armbands. There are armbands available. If you're online, you'll need to uh, uh, pay $10.95 postage and handling uh, to get that or just call into the office and pick it up. It's not 10.95, by the way. They're free. And if you're in the room, I want to encourage you to grab an armband that will help you win the day. Everyone say win. Win. Win the day. Win the day. Today's topic, last week was flip the script. And today's topic is called kiss the wave. On your notes, there are three uh, starting points that I want to just speak into. And they are these simple words, to be strong, to be supernatural, and to be strategic. To be strong, strong in spirit, strong being full of the Holy Spirit. Supernatural, it's hard to be supernatural if we're not full of the Holy Spirit. And we also need to be strategic with a what and a how. I learned many years ago that God is very good at giving us the what, but he's equally as good as giving us the how. The problem is we don't hang around for the how. I remember a time I was sitting at my desk and what, one of the biggest things that I'll ever ask God on a Friday, it's sort of my day to get in the zone for Sunday, is, Lord, what do you want to do on Sunday? It's your church, Lord. What do you want to do? And I remember this one day, I was in a different church, a different space and time, and I felt the Lord say, I want you to pray for every single person. I want you to anoint them with oil. And I got up from my desk going, I know what God wants me to do. This is awesome. This is going to go off. This would be brilliant. And as I walked across the floor of my office to get to the door, I put my hand on the door handle, but I was reasoning in my mind and I said to myself, I'll pray for everyone Sunday night because there's not as many people in the room and so we'll get through it a lot quicker. Now on a Sunday we'd have anywhere upwards of 300 people in the room and we're like, man, if we do that in the morning, we're not getting out of there till Tuesday. I don't know how this is going to work. When I put my hand on the door handle, I felt the rebuke of the Holy Spirit. It simply say, you just asked me what I wanted to do on Sunday and now you're trying to talk me out of it. So I closed my office door and I went back and sat at my desk. And I said, Lord, how would you like me to pray for everyone on Sunday? And within an instant, I was given a mental blueprint of the layout of our building. And five individuals' names literally came to me like that. And we divided up the auditorium into five sections. We put captains over each one of those sections. And you know what? We prayed for people. We anointed people. We had the whole church, over 300 people, prayed for, anointed, encouraged with words from God in under 10 minutes. And so it didn't make that the only thing God wanted to do. And I want to encourage you that God's big on strategic. Too often we ask what and we get it. And then we're thrown into a tailspin like, I don't know if I can do that, God. Oh, I just really don't know if I can do it. Take Moses, for example. He, he gets given the what and then he freaks out. But what he should have said is how. And we're going to look at that today in terms of kissing the way. Let's pray and then we're just going to get our skates on. Father God, today, Lord, as we open your word, we open our hearts. Lord, we want to be a people who win the day. Win the day for your glory, not our own. Win the day for your kingdom. But Lord, help us to do life with such a capacity that there's testimony about the way we live of the goodness of God. So Lord, we pray that your word would impact us, it would equip us and set us up to win the day. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. The phrase we're looking at today, kiss the wave, actually comes from Charles Spurgeon. 
Spurgeon at the age of 22 was speaking to a hall of over 10,000 people back in the 1800s. At six o'clock, hecklers entered into the meeting and just as he was about to open the word of God, they yelled out, fire, fire, the galleries are collapsing. And with that, pandemonium broke out amongst the hall with everyone trying to escape. Seven people lost their lives in that meeting, trying to get out of the building while the emergency crew were trying to get in the building to save people. His text for that day was Proverbs 3.33. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, a verse he would never ever preach again. Spurgeon said these words, I've learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. In Isaiah 26 verse 3, it says, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. <coughs> trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord himself is the rock <laughs> eternal. To kiss the wave to means to embrace the trial, kind of like a count it all joy context. We don't count it all joy that stuff comes against us. We count it all joy that God is with us no matter what waves are washing over us. Spurgeon later went on to write in a different context, it is a blessed thing when the waves of affliction wash us upon the rock of confidence in God alone. He also wrote, trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil and let us see what we are made of. Megan and I want you to know, on a week to week and every day, we're praying for you. We're standing with you. Where others may have left you, we are praying. When we have an evening meal, our family pray for you. Sometimes they're quite long prayers. I think our, our meals get cold and if I just open one eye, some of the children are just waiting over their food as if to say, can we go yet? <laughs> it's like we tend to pray for everyone. We pray for our street. We pray for the betterment of people who live as our neighbours in our street. We pray for our church. We pray for you and we're standing with you because we know that there are waves of affliction. We know that there are waves that wash against you, but we pray that the waves of challenge and trial would wash you upon the rock, the everlasting rock of Jesus Christ. Last week we looked at Joseph's story. There's a common thread that runs through each account of Joseph's ordeals from his being sold into Egypt as a slave and being wrongly incarcerated. In Acts chapter 7 verse 9 it says, And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him to Egypt, but God was with him. Everyone say, but God was with him. But God was with him. The Lord was with Joseph and, became, and he became a successful man and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw the Lord was with him. And the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. There is no doubt about it. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord is with you. He was with Joseph in the pit. He was with Joseph in the house where he worked as a slave. He was with Joseph in jail. He was with Joseph in the court of Pharaoh. He was with Joseph in the most dramatic confrontation of his entire life. The waves kept throwing Joseph against the rock of all ages. In 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 10, we get an account from Paul. It says, we are hard pressed on every side but we are not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Friend, if these accounts teach us nothing else, they're teaching us how to flip the script, how to kiss the wave, to flip the script, was coined from the verse, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Last week I said we should have 50-20 vision. This is what I meant. We meant to flip the script. Genesis 50, 20 says, You meant it for harm, but God 
many, for good, for the saving of many lives. Joseph could have lived as a victim. He could have lived under the circumstances, but he chose to remember the word of the Lord to him and flip the script. That's what it was, could have done. This is what it was meant to do in Jesus' name. So I pray today that the life of Jesus Christ would be revealed in your body. Today, what's the big idea? The big idea is this. You have to take the first step of faith before God will give you the second step revealed. In Exodus chapter 14, it's our text, and I'll give you a chance to turn there. It's such a long text, I haven't put it on the screens. It is a story you'll be familiar with. It's when Joseph, uh, Joseph, Moses, so you've got to be careful which patriarch you're, you're focusing on. Moses led the Israelites out and took them across the sea. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and all his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We've let the Israelites go and we've lost all their services. So they had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with the other chariots of Egypt, with officers all over them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. They were marching out boldly. The Israelites, in their escape, had totally seen the hand of God and they were marching out boldly. Remember that. The Egyptians, all the king's horses and all the king's men and troops pursued the Israelites and caught up with them as they camped by the sea. As Pharaoh approached the Israelites, the Israelites looked up and the Egyptians were marching after them. They were terrified. In just two verses earlier, they were marching out boldly. How good are we? We're off on the way. No one's going to stop us. And then they look behind them. Ah! It's like, what is going on here? We were bold, now we're scared. And they cried out to the Lord. They said, Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here in the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to be free and die in the desert. Friend, can I just speak to that a little bit? There are times when we look back in our past or in our present and go, I can't imagine a different future. Next weekend, we're believing God to see people heal, see people set free. But I want us just to be praying along the lines of strengthening our faith this week. Here were the Israelites under the tyranny of Egypt. They weren't just working under harsh conditions. They were oppressed and all of a sudden they're free and they're saying, I would rather be oppressed. I just want to speak plainly to this. There will be people who could receive a miracle if they align their faith and they stand on the word of God. But there'll be people that opt out of a miracle because of what it may mean when they're now free. I want us to pray into that as a church. God never came to keep us bound or in bondage. He never came to say, well, this is status quo, this is as good as it will ever be. I know that on the other side of people receiving some of the greatest miracles, there'll be other things that they have to grapple with. Maybe they no longer get a disability pension because they're made well. But if we've got faith to see God deliver us out of a wheelchair or out of an ailment, surely we should have faith to say, if he's going to go that far, then he's going to lead us on and provide for us in other ways as well. I really want to pray into that because I don't believe God ever came just to say, just hold it here, put a lid on it. This is as good as it will ever get. Come on, let's press in and let's believe God to do miracles. To have a testimony of the goodness and the favour of God. Yeah. And so they're being led out of the Egypt. And now they're starting to complain. They're starting to panic. Well, what's going to happen? And so the Lord said to Moses. Well, Moses said to the people, let's back it up a bit. Don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance of the Lord. The Lord will bring you a great victory today. 
The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. In my Bible, I wrote this in the margin. To be still in spirit, but to keep moving forward. Still in spirit, but still moving. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water, so that the Israelites can go see through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, though his chariots and horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord, and I will gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. The angel of the Lord, who had been travelling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all night the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a, water, water, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Everyone say, win. Win. Win, win, the, day. win the day. In Psalm 114 it says, the sea saw him and fled. There's an old axiom that says, if you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. Here's one more. Most of us spend all of our lives waiting for God to split the Red Sea. But maybe, just maybe, God's waiting for you to get your feet wet. Here's what I know for sure. If you want God to do the super, you have to do the natural. Three quick points. You have to be prepared to take a calculated risk. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. That word actually translated means calculated. The steps of a good man are calculated by the Lord. Is there something God is asking you to step into? Secondly, you need to make a defining decision. What decisions are before you? Write a list of the options and the ones that will glorify God. Which of your answers will leave a legacy? And thirdly, you have to take a flying leap of faith with God's help. This is all it takes for God to make a, side, a sidewalk through the sea. But you have to kiss the way. The first step is always the hardest. Why? I love the way it explains in, in the book of Win the Day. It says this, you have to overcome the law of inertia by exercising initiative. You have to overcome fear by exercising faith. You have to first step before God before he reveals the second. If God is faithful enough to give you the what, he is faithful enough to give you the how. The Israelites are trapped between the Egyptian army and the Red Sea. It seems like a no-win situation, death by sword or death by drowning. Put yourself in their sandals for a second. Imagine the sound of the horses and the chariots. The entire Egyptian army is coming at you full throttle. This is fight or flight. It says people panicked. But at this is also when leaders lead. This is when spirit-led leaders stay calm and carry on. This is when spirit-filled leaders step up and step in. That's who Moses is. And that's what Moses does. Fear not, stand still, and you will see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. So three simple thoughts this morning. We need to face our fear. We need to take our stand, and we need to hold our peace. What are the waves, what are the waves throwing you upon? The rock of all ages, or on despair? Firstly, we need to face your fear, or as I like to say, faith your fear. It sounds like I've got a list. Everyone say, faith your fear. Faith your fear. It sounds like you've got a list too. If you've got the Egyptian army coming at you full speed, it's fight or flight. And yet Moses still chooses to say, fear not. Easier said than done. Have you ever faced something where it's like, hey, don't be afraid. It's like, yeah, that's all right. 
for you to say. But courage is not the absence of fear. Fear is actually a prerequisite. The question is this, how do you manage fear in moments like this? According to psychologists, we're only born with two fears. One is the fear of falling, and the other is the fear of loud noises. Bang! I just thought I'd try that one out. Is everyone okay? okay. Sorry, Zion, I just woke him up. Every other fear is learned, which means every other fear can be unlearned. Faith is a process of unlearning fear. How? 1 John 4, 18 says, Perfect love casts out all fear. If you fear God, which is the beginning of wisdom, it means to hold God in the highest esteem, to revere God above all else. If you fear God, you don't have to fear anything else. The fear of God is the cure for every other fear. Joshua, Joseph Campbell said this, The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Fear can be conquered with faith to take another step. Faith to keep moving forward, to keep holding on to God. There's things we face in life that aren't pleasant. They aren't even what we saw coming. We don't know what we did to deserve them. But we need to keep moving and we need to keep holding on to God. What or who are you holding on to in God? Are you prepared to face your fears? Let me add this last little thought. We're a community of faith. We eat faith for breakfast, lunch and dinner. The net result, we dream big, we pray hard and we think long. We go after God-sized goals. We evaluate and activate each other's faith. And it creates a barrier against fear. We stand with each other. We lean in. We intercede. Even when people say, hey, please leave me alone. We may not contact you, but we contact God on your behalf. We are better together. One final thought on facing your fear. All of us want a miracle. None of us wants to be in, this, in the situation that necessitates a miracle. But you can't have one without the other. Here's the good news. When you experience a setback, you don't take a step back because God is already preparing your comeback. What does God say to Moses in Exodus 14, 4? I have planned this in order to display my glory. In what ways will God be glorified in, what, in your situation? And in what ways can you give God the glory? Point number two, we want to stand our ground. Stand still, as in, be still and know that I am God. The NIV says, stand firm. As in, having done all to stand, Stand firm. The Amplified says, take your stand. The Good News Translation says, stand your ground. Whichever way you slice it, the hardest thing to do if, if an Egyptian army is coming at you full speed is to stand. There's a scene in the movie Ford vs Ferrari where Carol Shelby, the race car driver played by Matt Damon, says there's a point at 7,000 revs per minute where everything fades. The machine becomes weightless. It just disappears. All that's left is a body moving through space and time at 7,000 RPM. That's where you mean it. That's where you feel it. It creeps up on you and it asks you a question, the only question that really matters. Who are you? I have no idea what's flying through Moses' brain at this point in time. His mind is spinning at 7,000 RPMs. But where do we go? What do we do? I wonder if he has a flashback to that burning bush. He asks God the question, who am I? You remember when he sees the bush and he goes, and God speaks and he goes, yeah, but who am I? 7,000 RPMs. I love the way God answers Moses' question, not by answering the question that Moses asked, but by answering the question Moses should have asked. God says, I will be with you. That's all we need to know. So at 7,000 RPMs, and Moses says, stand still, there's a moment where we discover who we are and who God is. General Anthony McAuliffe said to his American troops when they were totally surrounded at the end of, by the enemy at the Battle of the Bulge. Anyone having one of those at the moment? I always look in the mirror and just double check. Um, he said this, Men, we have the greatest opportunity ever afforded an army. 
we can attack in any direction. Now that's flipping the script and that's kissing the wave. In crisis situations, I go back to ground zero. I go back to the foot of the cross. I make a beeline for the empty tomb. I go to the promise to which I can stand on. He who began a good work in me will carry it out to completion. He is watching over his word to perform it in your life. He's working all things together for good. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I sing songs like, Great is thy faithfulness. What's your battle song? What's the soundtrack of your life when you're being called to stand and to make a stand? We have a core value. If you stay humble, stay hungry. There's nothing God cannot do in or through you. A great worship leader said this, being secure in your faith is knowing God can do it. Being secure in your identity is knowing God can do it through you. That's how we're to stay in our lane and that's how we're to stay the course. The most underestimated kind of power is staying power. It's long obedience in the same direction. It's the cumulative effect of faith, hope and love. It's the compound interest in prayer and fasting. On November 31, 1517, Martin Luther posted 95 theses on the doors of Castle Church when he was told to recant them in Germany at the Diet of Worms. It's actually read Worms, but I'm, I'm just going to say Worms because I actually got the chuckles when I read that. Um, Luther said, My conscience is taken captive by God's word. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. We need that kind of moral courage, especially in this cultural moment. How do you kiss the wave? You ground yourself in the word of God. You anchor yourself to the promises of God, but you also embrace the pain and the suffering. The hardest lesson to learn and the hardest lesson you've got to learn will cultivate the right sort of character. You're probably familiar with the five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression and acceptance. Can I throw one more in there? Meaning. What's the meaning of all of this? I wrote this little phrase, he who has a what to do with a side order of how will accomplish great things in God. Get your what and your how from God and pursue them with all your heart. Sometimes it's not how it reads, that it may read like this. I don't like what I'm going through, but I am going to choose how I'm going through this. We had a moment where we had lots of promises in trying to fall pregnant and around about, I think it was the fourth or fifth year of consistently trying, we finally fell pregnant and then had a miscarriage. And we had just this moment where it was kind of like we had all these promises from God and we're like, God, how does this happen? Like, but you said this and you confirmed it this and the word came here. We had a gentleman from the States call us up on stage in a convention and prophesy over us. Not did he know, but a man from our church the night before on an altar call pulled us forward and he prophesied over us and the man from the state said word for word what the guy before had said. They didn't know one another. And I'm like, well, God, you've got our attention. So as we're travelling on and continually trying, 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 we finally fall pregnant and I remember driving home from the hospital late at night while leaving Megan in the hospital and I just cried out to God. I said, God, where are you in all of this? You said we were going to have a family and now it's gone. I've never heard the audible voice of God. But I'll tell you this, Psalm 11 verse 4 leapt in my spirit. I could not get home quick enough. At 1 o'clock in the morning I flew inside, left all the car doors open to get my Bible. And it simply read this. I am on my holy throne examining everyone on heaven and on earth. The only question I ask God is, God, where are you? He said, this is exactly where I am. I haven't left you, I haven't forsaken you, and I'm still in control. When you get a word from God, it enables you to stand and even in the toughest, toughest of times. And the only way to kiss the wave is to say, I don't like what's happening to me, but I'm going to choose 
how I respond to what's happening to me. You know, we fell in love with the Word of God and just kept declaring it over our family. And now we have five beautiful children. And they're all... <laughs> great blessing. <laughs> Lastly, we better wrap this up so you can go have Mother's Day lunch. Hold your peace. There's an ancient tradition practiced in Orthodox churches called Pass the Peace. It actually traces back to the Sermon on the Mount. If you're offering a gift and you realize you're at odds with somebody else, you go and reconcile your odds before you give your gift. It's a great thought. Oh, when I was looking at all the protests that recently happened in America, and they were quite shocking and jarring, there was one that stood out to me. It was a police officer seeing the crowds press in, and they were angry. And instead of putting his shield and drawing his weapon, he actually took his shield and his weapon, and he laid it on the ground and said, I'm going to march with you. Oh. It was the greatest act of peace in those moments of great turmoil. When a police officer who everyone seemingly were against said, you know what, I agree with you and I'm going to stand with you and I'm going to march with you. And he marched with the angry crowd and you could see the anger just evaporate. It was a powerful moment. You know, we all have peace to give. When we're struggling with peace, we should turn to the Bible and find peace scriptures. When peace like a river. You can sing the song if you want. Let's be honest, in our current climate and everything that we're facing, people have lost a whole lot. They continually struggle with anxiety or depression. So how do we get our peace back? How do we hold our peace when it feels like the, we the world is spinning off its axis and the train is going off the tracks? All those who follow the Prince of Peace, we stay calm and we carry on. We are a people who rebuke the wind and the waves and we say to the storm, peace, be still. We don't take offence, we take offence. We attack, we come on and we're ready. We don't react, we proact. To proact means to take proactive measures, to act in advance, to anticipate. How? As grace givers and peacemakers. And when we do, we shift the atmosphere. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times, in every way. The Lord be with you all. 2 Thessalonians 3, 16. Jude 1, verse 2. May mercy, peace and love be multiplied to you. Isaiah 26, 3 is right where we start. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. Friend, as you kiss the wave, when it throws you on the rock of all ages, may you discover peace. May you discover longing, hope and joy. Let's all stand this morning as we bring this to a close. This morning's message is pretty simple. If you want to kiss the wave, you have to face your fear. You have to stand your ground and you have to hold your peace. However, it's a simple message, but nothing is easy about these three things. Easier said than done, no doubt. I love what happens next. The Lord says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. I'm not sure what step of faith you need to take today. But I do know this, the first step is the hardest. The law of inertia. Inertia is if a body is at rest or moving at a constant speed in a straight line, it will remain at rest or keep moving in a straight line at constant speed unless it's acted upon by a force. In the same way you have to overcome the law of inertia by exercising initiative, you have to overcome fear by exercising your faith. If you need marriage counselling, it's hard to get into the water. If it's losing weight, it's hard to take that first step. If you're training for a marathon, it's hard to get going. If it's resolving conflict, that's going to be hard. The first step is always the hardest. But if you want God to do the super, you have to do 
the natural. If you want God to make a way through the sea, you have to move toward the water and kiss the waves. There are two types of people in the world, plotters and plotters. One's double T, one's double D. Plotters are people who see a far off future, who have a vision beyond their resources. They set God-sized goals. They dream the unthinkable and attempt the impossible. I like plotters, but I tend to admire the plotters a little bit more. Plotters are the people who get up every morning and win the day. They stay humble and they stay hungry. They stay in their lane and they stay the course. Come on church, let's be a church that fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. In other words, he kissed the wave for you and for me. And I want to encourage you, for you to win the day, learn how to kiss the wave. Come on, with every eye shut, why don't you just reach out to God right now? Father God, we thank you for this word. Lord, it's a challenging word. It seems simple on paper, but it's challenging. Lord, it challenges me, and I know it challenges our church. Lord, we know that the stuff that happens in this world is not to bring us down, but it is to bring you glory. And Lord, if we learn to flip the script, Lord, to, to really read the season of the day, that may have been sent to harm me, but Lord, you've set it up for good, for the saving of many souls. Lord God, that you would teach us to kiss the way, to not run from persecution or tribulation or trial, but through, excuse me, the developing of our character. Lord God, you, you would see your glory right here on planet Earth. Lord, teach us these vital and valuable lessons. Not to ask, oh, what, why me? Woe is me. How come? But Lord, to give us that steel and determination to rise up, to kiss the wave, and to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.